Hey there, everybody. This is Sam from Samuel Plays Brass, and this is a one-of-a-kind horn. Stay tuned to learn more. This is going to be another retrospective vlog because once again, the one-year anniversary of a significant musical event in my life has snuck up on me. We've even got some yesteryear-themed apparel to go with the occasion. In fact, today, August 15th of last year, I visited a trumpet maker. Brent Peters, the current owner and maker of the Pudgy Trumpets line, very intuitively spelled P-U-J-E, is based in the city of Palouse, Washington, or rather, just outside of it. And last summer, he invited me down to his shop to embark on a custom project. And today, we're gonna talk about how this weird little thing came to be. So I guess the logical first thing to address is the question of what exactly is this thing? Because of how non-standard it is, it might not be readily apparent, so we'll start from the beginning. This would technically be considered a sopranino trumpet, I believe. Let me clarify. The standard trumpet family has several main members. For instance, the B-flat and C trumpets that you do most of your playing on are considered mezzo-soprano instruments. The soprano member of the family plays in either D or E-flat, like that Bach trumpet there. And then the piccolo trumpet, this beautifully matching Bach, plays in high A or high B-flat. Whereas this thing sits in the middle between those two. Currently, it is set up to play in the key of F, but it can also play in the key of E natural. And that feature is thanks to the fact that we made sure that it would take Bach piccolo trumpet lead pipes, of which I have four. If you want to find out more about the Bach artisan piccolo trumpet, you can click the review up in the top right corner in the card there. But essentially, we have four lead pipes on the Bach, two of them with a cornet shank and two of them with a trumpet shank, two of them in B flat and two of them in A, so that you essentially get all four combinations. And we made sure that these lead pipes would fit on this trumpet when we designed it, so that we'd have the option to play in either F or E, and we could choose between either a trumpet or cornet mouthpieces, depending on the, st the sound and style that was desired. For this frankly interesting and hitherto nearly unattempted task, Brent had a few things lined up. Before we met, we did some blueprinting, and so we'd had some of the math hashed out, and he also had some parts which belonged to an old European stencil trumpet. Nothing particularly remarkable, but it was built on a 450 bore, which is, for one thing, a little bit smaller than most B-flat trumpets nowadays, and also, for another thing, the same bore as a Bach piccolo trumpet, and so we had something at least to work with there. And so, on the sweltering Sunday morning of August 15th, I pulled up at Brent's little workshop in the Palouse. It's a really cool little spot, there's all sorts of cool stuff everywhere, whether it's the machines or the crazy trumpet parts. Pudgy trumpets are really cutting edge in the way they're built and designed, and Brent himself is doing some really interesting and unique things in that field, so it was cool to pick up random things and be like, huh, I haven't seen one of those before. In any case, I was there with an even crazier idea, something that Brent made pretty clear to me. I was there to design and build an instrument that would take Bach piccolo trumpet lead pipes and play in the key of F. I was intrigued and inspired by the works of Mahler, Strauss, and such composers during that period who would write for a trumpet in F, supposedly. I was mistaken at the time. They were written for long F trumpets, longer than standard B flat trumpets, and pitched an octave lower than what I had in mind, but in any case, I was there to build a miniature F trumpet. Going into this project, we had a few core principles that we were operating on. Firstly, the thing with the adjustable Bach lead pipes. That was pretty much a necessity because not only would it save a lot of labor in terms of getting the mouthpiece receiver just right, but also another core principle of mine was the wrap of the instrument, which what I had in mind wouldn't allow for terribly much of a tuning slide in the conventional sense, and so those adjustable lead pipes were pretty much necessary to make sure we could still actually get a decent amount of adjustability on the pitch of the instrument. In any case, I wanted the wrap to have a very particular look to it. I wanted to create essentially a mini E-flat trumpet that followed the Yamaha wrapping style rather than the Bach long bell or Schilke extra long bell, I suppose. I definitely didn't want it looking like a Schilke, which was something that Brent had initially proposed. He wanted to create something that was in between the designs of the Schilke G trumpet and E-flat trumpet. And um, I didn't let him deviate too much from what I wanted. He complied as much as he possibly could in that regard and helped me to achieve my vision in that sense. The other core principle was that I wanted this horn to sort of maintain the piccolo trumpet sound more or less while maybe having some of the middle and low register benefits in terms of added clarity and better intonation that the E-flat trumpet had. And the result was questionable, of course, because what on earth were we doing? But we certainly gave it our best shot. The brunt of this project, where several long hours were spent, was the cutting up of all the various tubes off that stencil trumpet in just the right fashion so that eventually the math would work out to allow the trumpet to play approximately in the key of F. Now, although Brent and I had calculated with a fair amount of precision the lengths of all the valve slides on this instrument so that we would know exactly what we were getting into there, 
there was still a fair amount of educated guesswork going on, because that's far from all of the tubing on the instrument. There was still the bell, which Brent had a pretty clear idea of. He had a nice bell set aside for that process. It was designed for something of this nature and worked very well for its task, but unfortunately that still left the lead pipe, the tuning crook, and the leg just below the lead pipe, and that all still had to be mathed out. The trouble with using a stencil instrument as a template was the fact that we were working with a finite supply of tubing. It wasn't just brass stock tubing that we could cut to whatever length we liked. We had to get all of the valve slide measurements right on to begin with so that we would still have enough tubing preserved for the rest of the instrument so we could have some variability in how we would try and put the rest of it together. And so the whole process was a little bit stressful. Designing a custom trumpet is never the easiest process in the world, but it was definitely a lot of fun. And I think cutting the tubes was my favorite and the most satisfying part of the project. I videoed clips of several different tubes that I cut just because it was so fun. I loved, you know, bringing the chuck over and making the first divot in the tube and then turning on the machine to make the final cut and then sanding it down and all that. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that part very much. And uh, to be honest, I didn't get video of much else because I either forgot to or it was too tricky and Brent and I were putting our heads together and using every one of our brain cells to figure out how it was going to work in the moment. Considering this was a design that Brent had never worked with or even, even thought of working with, I think he did an admirable job and helped me keep my head straight in moments of what the heck is going on. Now, unfortunately, you can't just take tubes and stick them together to make a trumpet. Your job is far from done once the tubing is cut. The next part of the project involved a lot of soldering, which really stressed me out. I'd done some soldering at that point at Clearwater Music, but I wasn't very good at it. It's still something that I struggle a fair amount with, although I'm now starting to get in my stride as far as that goes. I designed a custom cornet in the key of C at Clearwater earlier that summer, and you can tell I made a real pig's ear out of some of that soldering. It really wasn't good. And so I straight up told Brent on this, like, look, I appreciate any tips you can give me, but for the purposes of making a functioning instrument, it might be best if you take on most of the soldering. And so he did. There was a fair amount of stress during this part as well, because things seemed to want to fall apart if they weren't tacked together just the right way, in the right order, in the right fashion. But, you know, Brent managed one way or another. It was a pretty Herculean task. I'm just gonna tack that there so we don't have a disaster in quest then. After this step in the process, the end was drawing nearer in sight. We were certainly starting to see something that more closely resembled a trumpet, but the trouble is our lead pipe situation was still somewhat unresolved. We didn't really know what to do because the taper off that stencil trumpet was not in any way, shape, or form going to fit on this instrument due to the length of it, and especially not if we were going to use the Bach piccolo pipes on it. And so we kind of had to put our heads together and think about it. The best thing we could come up with was to take the outer tuning slide off of the stencil trumpet, fit the Bach lead pipe into that, and then, you know, tack on the other end of the tuning slide to make it long enough. And then where the Bach lead pipe stopped inserting, we would there insert the inner slide off of that stencil trumpet and tack it in place so that we wouldn't have too much of a gap to a larger bore. It was all really odd. What we ended up with was essentially a cylindrical lead pipe, which if you know anything about trumpet manufacturing is mathematically very suboptimal and results in some strange physics with the instrument. But at that point, there truly was nothing else we could do. There was no way we were getting any sort of taper on that. And so we got that in place and then we got the bell in place and, and braced all of that, which was another soldering nightmare, by the way. And it was at this point that it was starting to get late. I went out for dinner and Brent put some finishing touches on the instrument. I came back, he handed me the horn, I blew, and approximately an F came out and we rejoiced. We were so happy. It was a little squirrely, but you know, I got a whole concert F scale out on written C fingerings. And so we had an instrument that was playing in the key of F. So after a very final few alterations and some really cool engraving, by the way, which I'll show off later, we had somewhat of a functioning instrument. At that point, it was getting to be quite late and I needed to get back for a busy work week. So we said our goodbyes and I left one trumpet richer than I came. And so here we are, a full year later with effectively the same instrument. The only difference is it might need to be polished or buffed again because it's accumulated a little bit of a patina over the past 12 months. Most of the time it's been sitting on the windowsill as sort of a trophy of our efforts. And so it has gotten a little bit more matte looking, but I might honestly keep it that way because it's cool and adds character. In any case, this horn oozes character. It is really cool and it's got an interesting mix of old and new parts. The valve section especially, these vintage valves are really cool and have a lot of character. If you unscrew them and look at the inside pistons, they have this really interesting and somewhat antiquated design that you don't see anymore. I'm lucky that the valve section is only minorly leaky, not majorly so, like a lot of them are. So it's not perfectly airtight, but it's about as good as I can ask for and doesn't make the instrument too terribly squirrely. In fact, you'll hear it in this clip.
I think honestly it plays fairly well. It's got a lot of cool features. Brent did a really good job with this screw system. He's got it really durable so that the lead pipe holds right where it needs to and I don't need to worry about it breaking off. He did some really cool engraving like I mentioned. He put August 2021 on the inside of the lead pipe which is a little bit hard to see. And then more prominently on the outside he put my channel name which is not something that I asked for but it was really super considerate of him to do and it is a really cool feature. His engraving is incredibly precise. If there was one spot in the instrument I would buff, it is definitely that, because it would really bring out the lettering nicely. And in any case, this instrument isn't quite finished in the entire 100% sense. There are a couple things I need to do to it, such as refit that second slide. You can kind of hear and feel it wiggle around in its slot, which is really disconcerting. First of all, that means it's definitely not airtight, but also it creates this really annoying buzzy noise, sort of a, a vibration. If you press down the second valve and play some lower notes on it, such as low G sharp or low A or low B. And so what I have to do currently is actually hold my hand in place over the second slide to keep it from vibrating, which is not good. So I definitely have to expand those inner tubes and get them to fit a little better. And I also wanna have some intonation adjustability on the first valve. I originally wanted a spring-loaded trigger there, but that is honestly probably a little bit bulky for something like this and wouldn't really work with the vintage design and the way that it's set up. What I think I would do is find a smaller ring for the third slide because it's just rather large at the moment. It fits my thumb. And so what I would do is I would move this ring over to the thumb slide for first valve intonation, and then I would find something a little bit smaller for the third slide, and we'd be able to adjust both as needed. I also originally wanted to put an Amato water key on the main crook, but to be honest, I might not do that just because I'm worried that Anything involving drilling a hole into this already strangely designed instrument might totally throw the whole thing off. And so I would rather just, you know, do the French horn dancey dance every half an hour, 45 minutes. This thing does not accumulate much condensation, and so I really don't have a problem doing that once in a while. It is a little squirrely, like I said, but it's got some really, really nice playing characteristics. It does mostly maintain the sound of a piccolo, but just with a little bit of extra breadth to it. It's still a thinner sound than something like a solid E-flat trumpet or E-flat cornet, but it can harness either the brightness or the darkness of either of those, just with a slightly narrower and more direct sound, which is really cool. I'd also like to take a moment to highlight Brent's sheer generosity throughout this entire process. The reason I have this trumpet is because I was a finalist in, but not the winner of his pudgy V4 giveaway. The winner obviously walked away with a free V4, and for the rest of us for whom he had no more V4s to give out for free, because that's a significant financial hit, he reached out to each of us individually and tried in some way to make it up to each of us. He found out that I was fairly local, and he actually invited me down to the shop to, for one thing, try out some pudgies, and for another, potentially build something of my own. And now that got me excited. It got me thinking, what can I create that's fairly unconventional and something that I definitely don't have in my arsenal yet, but that will be fairly useful and maybe will even pave the way and leave somewhat of a legacy for the trumpet family and something that might be used in the future. And so this was my answer to all of those and it was a lot of fun. Brent was so hospitable and welcoming and kind and helpful the whole time. He's an incredibly humble and kind man and made the whole experience incredible. Although he didn't exactly know some of the steps of this process because it was new to him and I, cre I proposed something that was totally off the walls, he did a great job of figuring it all out on the fly and keeping my head straight in the process. He really made the experience one for me to remember and cherish forever. So above all, I would like to say, Brent, thank you for everything. This was amazing. I ended up with something arguably cooler than a Pudgy V4, because while that's an incredible horn and it plays great and has some awesome characteristics to it and is on the forefront of modern trumpet technology, this is a little ugly duckling that is the project of a lot of hard labor and hard thought. Like I said, we used every brain cell between the two of us to get this thing working, but it just has so much character and is something nearly unheard of. I know Yamaha makes an F trumpet, but this is definitely not something you see every day, and I think it has a lot of potential. If you'd like to learn more about this custom horn and hear exactly what it can do with four different lead pipes, make sure to leave a like and a comment down below letting me know and we can definitely make that happen. All of your support on the channel is greatly appreciated, and also if you find that you've watched this far and you haven't currently subscribed to the channel, I would really appreciate it if you did so. It's a small gesture with a huge impact. Most of my viewers are not actually subscribed, which is a shame, but subscribing is the best way to stay up to date with this sort of stuff, and believe me, there is no shortage of nerdy trumpet content. So there will be plenty more in the future, and if you do subscribe, you'll be able to stay up to date with all that. In any case, this has been Sam of Samuel Plays Brass, recounting some really amazing experiences with Brent Peters of Pudgy Trumpets, and how I ended up with a one-of-a-kind horn. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, we'll see you on the flip side.